All right. And looks like our Hangout is live. Okay, my name yeah. is M Mike Huberty, and I am Artist Services Manager at Broadgem.com. And with me is our CEO. I'm Roy Elkins. I'm the CEO of Broadgem.com. Okay. And for anybody that's unfamiliar with Broadgem, uh, what we do is we provide promotion for musicians, artists, composers, um, touring musicians, just different tools that you can use to further your music career. And uh, we also have some cool things for people who are fans and buyers of music. Is we got a great mechanism for you to find awesome music that you're looking for. So that's a little introduction to broadjam.com. And today what we're doing is we're taking questions from some of our members and talking about music promotion and your music career. So, uh, live on YouTube, why don't we start, Roy, uh, first of all, I'm going to invite a few more of our Broad Jam members here, see if they want to come in. And let's jump in and take uh, one of the questions from... Uh, one of our members that was emailed this week. How does that sound? Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. Starting out, this is a question from Andy. Now, Andy asks, Hey, it feels so an exclusive contract is the deal to go for, but then I've never had any deal of any kind, so my priority might be that I need to get any deal first. It seems, though, I could be sharing my own music and songs on the cheap if I go for a non-exclusive, or perhaps I'm simply misunderstanding the whole business. Could I please get a simple explanation? Well, so I think we better talk about non-exclusive versus exclusive and maybe what a fledgling musician should go for. It's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, thanks for that question, Andy. Um, you know, and don't feel you're in the same, or you're, you're in the boat alone. Everybody is in that same boat. An exclusive contract means when you sign a contract with a publishing company or any, anybody representing your song, that they're the only ones that can represent it. And generally, you're going to get off, give up half of your song rights when you do that. You're going to give up all the publishing rights. A non-exclusive contract means that uh, you can sign a non-exclusive arrangement with somebody, and they can shop the song, but they only get paid on what they place. Um, now, the question you're asking, should I just sign an exclusive contract so I can get a deal with anybody? Or so, so I can just get a deal is what you're asking. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. I think, first of all, looking over the terms of every contract is the most important thing. Now, if the exclusive contract was with a major publishing company, uh, they've offered you a little money up front, then you, know, you might want to go for it. But whatever you sign, always make sure there's a term on it so you can get out of it. Uh, you shouldn't sign anything in perpetuity, meaning forever, uh, unless you are getting uh, a big sum of cash up front. Because if somebody wants to sign your song to exclusive, an exclusive contract, they probably have a good idea that they can go make some money with it. Um, so, and you shouldn't sign that exclusive contract unless they're going to give you some money up front. Because that puts their, they, they now have a stake in the game. They have to go make money with a song. So, uh, so often, in fact, there's a, a, a band locally here uh, in Madison that uh, a bunch of young kids about three or four years ago signed an exclusive deal with a company. I think they were out of Chicago uh, for all their songs in perpetuity. And so the publishing company owns the songs forever, and they can't do anything with the songs. And so be very careful. Uh, and always make sure you get an attorney to review the contracts before you sign them. And there's a lot of good attorneys who won't charge you an arm and a leg. We have one that we recommend, so you can send a, a, a note to us offline, and we'd be happy to um, forward her information to you. I hope that answers your question, Andy. Mike, maybe you have something to add? Uh, well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, first of all, like nothing. remember, nothing we say substitutes for legal advice. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> We are not lawyers, but we, we do have experience with contracts. We've experienced with hundreds, if not thousands, of broad jam artists have signed publishing contracts based up on the connections that we put them through with our music licensing submission system. And we've looked at plenty of contracts ourselves. Um, but the fact is, 
you really got to think that sometimes an exclusive might be a good idea if you have an I if you think that that publisher is going to go to bat for you. If you are going to be um, the smallest fish in that publisher's pond, you might want to just go ahead and promote it yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I never would say that you want any type of deal. You want your foot in the door, absolutely. And, yeah. and the fact that a publisher would be interested in your song at all, I think, is a is that's the first good sign that your music is broadcast quality and it's up to snuff and people think that they can make money with it. That's right. And, that's right. Um, that's a good. That's a good sign that you're on the right track in the first place. But don't worry to take any kind of, I mean, contract that you can get right away. It's, it's not a race. It's just take your time, talk to a lawyer, and um, get everything checked out. Because if somebody's offering you a contract in the first place, it means that you're on the right track. And I think the music business, and, and Roy, you know this, the music industry is full of. Uh, you know, bad deals signed by artists earlier in their career where they just get completely, like, you know, they, it's not that a lot of people looking out to screw you because that's really not it. Yeah, that's not it. Yeah. It's just everybody's going to try to take, get, get the best deal for themselves they can. Yeah, I think Mike makes a good point there. Don't, don't sign just to sign the deal. Uh, it, it, I think it's really important that, uh, we'll stress, get somebody to look at the contract. But if they, you know, if they're, if, if most people will not sign a song just to fill out their catalog, um, because they don't want to waste your time, they don't want to waste their time. Um, so, you know, the, the probably the best rule of thumb to signing a contract, obviously after the lawyer part of it, is to make sure the person has a track record. If they don't have a track record of placing songs in film and TV or songs on records, it's probably not a good idea to sign with them, period. It's just, they're probably just starting out. Now, there are some very legitimate people that are starting out, but you really want to network as much as you can uh, you know, talk to several different publishers, get some feedback, um, but make sure they have a track record. If they don't have a track record, it's probably not a good idea. That That's a good point. I mean, do your diligent research for every person you work with because the kind of people you work with also will, I mean, that does reflect on you. You know, have you, how many times, I mean, I, I've encountered this situation a bunch of times where you meet somebody um, and, the, and the person in the band and, and the artist in the band is really nice and stuff like that, but they have the sleaziest manager in the world. And so it, it really it reflects poorly on the band because it's like, who do they choose to work with? You know, uh, this person that I wouldn't trust, period. I wouldn't, you know, trust with somebody, you know, somebody else's career, never mind my own. Yeah, right. So uh, think about who you work with. And, and Andy actually is watching the Hangout right now. and. Roy, he asked a question here, and let's see if we can answer it for him. Um, so thanks for your comments so far. I've heard it's possible for non-exclusive contracts that can result in a song being retitled, and there might be problems with that in the future. So maybe we better clarify retitling real quick for Andy and, and see potential upsides and downsides. Well, yeah, let's talk about retitling. What retitling is, is if you have a non-exclusive contract with five different publishers, generally each publisher will retitle a non-exclusive contract. In fact, you should make sure that happens because what when, when the networks or the broadcast uh, production company reports the plays to ASCAP and BMI, uh, they want to know what publisher to pay if it's a non-exclusive deal. If it's an exclusive deal, then they know, they know who to pay. The problem is in the future when all this becomes automated via uh, waveform recognition technology which is already there, uh, then it's going to be a real problem. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen for a while, but you know, I wouldn't, that's why you should make sure that your non-exclusive agreements have a term on them. Just make sure they're a three, five year term. I think, you know, that's three or five years is fair for a non-exclusive contract. So, but there, it, it, it isn't whether there will be problems. There will be technology problems with these contracts in the future. There's no doubt about that. Everybody knows that. I think that that's a good point, um, because this is going to, I mean, blow wide open 
you know, depending on where the business goes. But I mean, some people don't like retitles, and they they just want to work um, with exclusive contracts. But really, if you're just getting out and stuff like that, like we said, don't worry about don't don't sign a deal just to sign a deal. But at the same time, um, I wouldn't be afraid of retitling for the first. I mean, maybe I'm biased because I I signed a few non-exclusive retitle contracts. You know, when I first started promoting my music and things like that. But I. I I wouldn't be afraid of retitling um, right now, and we have several. I mean, we work with several publishers who do a great job with retitled, retitled libraries, and they're getting placements in film and TV. And so, um, I don't. It's it's just there. There's going to be some issues in the future, and there, but you think about those things, and, and maybe it is in your interest to get something going right now. But I, you know, cross that bridge, and each situation is going to be unique. And a lot of it depends on the publisher that you could be working with, and uh, that's. But definitely, that's a great question, Andy. And uh, thank you for asking it. Yep. Now we got we got another one from Adam Avery, one of our fine. I mean, a fine broad gem musician. I've been looking, Roy. I've been looking at Adam Avery's face every day for the past month because we added a song of the month banner to the bottom of every single one of our emails, and Adam's was the first one we featured. Yeah. And I so would, uh, I feel like that one picture of Adam, I feel like I know him personally. Yeah, I, I do. There's so many people on the site. You see their photos all the time. In fact, yeah. I was just, I just wrote a blog today at uh, uh, greatpeopleroyalkins.org, and uh, Adam Avery is in Oh, no, I'm sorry, on, on Liner Notes. And Adam is in that blog. I did, I did a review of the uh, current pop rock top ten because I thought – that the concepts for all the songs were pretty interesting in that top ten today. So Adam, you're in. Uh, you're at. Go down liner notes. Click on uh, the very top blog, and uh, you'll see. Uh, you're mentioned there briefly. So um, the question is: is how do we get more supervisors and publishers involved? Uh, Mike, I'll, I'll um, take a stab at it, but first, but you could probably elaborate a little more. Um, you know, uh, let me start with our criteria. We don't have uh, thousands that we work with. We're very picky. Uh, if they don't follow up, they don't uh, do what they say they're going to do, they're gone. Many of our supervisors and publishers are also pro reviewers on our site. A lot of times they come in the door to Broad Jam that way, and uh, then they start uh, providing listings for us. Um, but we're, we're, we're very picky. We don't have as many as maybe some other sites have because we want to make sure that everybody that comes on board is signing songs and placing songs. And we've had to let a couple of go that signed a lot of songs, but they just didn't get anything uh, licensed in place. So um, as far as recruiting, we're constantly talking to new people. Uh, and Mike, maybe you can elaborate a little more on that because that's really what you do. Absolutely. In fact, I, I talked about this in, uh, I think, what the licensing emails today because we're saying, like, well, like 60% of what we do is, I mean, look, we're looking for opportunities for our members constantly. And um, it's going through and, and seeing, like, hey, who's who's been getting placements? Who's been, um, you know, you'll, you'll meet different people at conferences and things like that, and you'll say, like, hey, that, this guy is a music supervisor. Maybe he's interested in broad jam. He's not into listings yet. Maybe he'll just accept pro reviews, and then we can start with that. Where it's like, yeah, you know, start start listening to broad jam songs. And then a lot of time, if they see the quality of music that they're getting to the pro review, um, they'll be like, okay, this is a place where I can get music from, uh, and it becomes a trusted source of music. And you know, that really, that's a. So any new possible partnerships on the horizon, Adam, that yeah. is something that, um, yeah, absolutely, every day we have new possible uh, partnerships because we're constantly uh, going back and forth and trying to negotiate new things, getting people interested and getting them into the mechanism and learning how to use it. And, um, and a lot of times, I mean, I'll even go to different sites and I'll see, you know, who's there, what are they doing, um, how you know how is Broad Gem going to be different? Not just different than them, but better than the other sites that are going to do that. You know, if I go to a site and I see somebody had submitted a song two years ago, and there's some in the comments section, they're like, "Well, this person never listened to my song," then 
you know that that's that's the kind of thing that we don't want and never have happened here because um, I know if I spend money to send a song to somebody and and I used to participate in listings and things like that and I was a broad jam member long before I ever worked here um, I would want to make damn sure <laughs> that that song gets listened to just like if we send our own music and just like we're doing anything ourselves uh, Really, so we check the other sites. We go through. Hey, who's you know? Maybe somebody's taking music on another site. Maybe Broad Jam is a place for them too. So we keep on looking. And and the other thing is, when Roy said that we've had to let people go because they're not producing, that's for certain. Um, we check in every quarter. What are the new placements? What have you got? I mean, are there some? Did you get some successes for a Broad Jam member this you know past quarter? And that's. That's the rating of, if that person hasn't, then we have to question our relationship with them because um, maybe we don't have the right music. For, if they're not getting success and they're not um, producing for our members, then we have to move on and find somebody that will because that's going to look bad on us and it feels like it's a waste and, and that's the last thing we want to do because the more placements we get, the better we look, the more people want to participate, the happier the providers are, period. It's, it's, a, it's a cycle that keeps going. So the more success begets more success in this kind of industry. So, uh, yeah, and, and you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's a good question that Adam asked because, you know, we want to keep it fresh. It, you know, we want to keep new people coming in, but it's just as important, if not more important to us, to keep songs getting licensed, period. Uh, we, we want songs to get licensed and placed, and that's the most important thing to us. Um, however, you know, we, we do want fresh and new opportunities. You know, we'd like to, you know, maybe find some more festivals and maybe some more ad agencies and things like that because we're real strong in film and TV. Um, and, you know, maybe we start stretching outside of our, our normal channels, and and we do. And I... I I think over the next few months you'll you'll see uh, uh, more additions. No, and just correct me if I'm wrong though, Mike. In the last few weeks, we've probably added what ten new pro reviewers or five. Uh, there's been quite a few new ones added, so we got yeah. a whole batch that we're gonna start working with. I've got more to put up too. Like I'm just like there's guys in the queue that I'm trying to get. I could probably put up. I mean, at least several days. Uh, I mean, uh, new pro reviewers. So we got guys, and we're just getting contracts back right now of some really exciting ones. That will be putting up. I like to launch it near Wednesday because it's near the newsletter, and that kind of gets. It's got that fresh thing where everybody gets excited. Um, but abs I mean, absolutely. There's new people coming on um, every single week, and, and that for the foreseeable future too. I mean, yeah, for the foreseeable future too. So I'm excited about the kind of people we're working with because I think um, our members are going to keep seeing us. You know, as the site, as the pro reviewer section gets bigger and the licensing mechanism gets more popular. They're going to see it go up and up on the food chain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Yep. Good question, Adam. By the way, uh, anybody who's listening out there, uh, go listen to Adam Avery's song, Redefined. It is one of the finest, most well-written songs on our website. And uh, I listened to it again today, and I just it just reminded me when I was writing that blog at on liner notes that um, how good of a songwriter he is. He is one of the better ones we have on the site. And Congrats on that, Adam. Yeah, he's great, and uh, I'm I'm partial to end of the money myself, and I'm not even a country guy, but I think that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, that's a great. That is a great song too. It's a great song too. Great, great uh, duet on that song. Mm -hmm. Very good duet. Okay, well, thanks for that question, Adam. Now let's go to another email question, and, and I mean this is probably something we could talk about for hours, but let's. Um, this is from Melissa V. Now, Melissa V emailed me earlier this week on things to talk about in the Hangout, and she wanted to talk about tips for home recording. And, and this is something that I think a lot of our members uh, have to deal with because a lot of them are songwriters. I mean, songwriters, and, and you got an idea, you start recording it, and then what do you do? Can you, can you submit the song you recorded at home? Can, you know, what's the next thing you should do? So maybe we should get into a little bit about recommended things for home recording, demo versus broadcast quality and stuff like that. What are your first thoughts on it, Roy? Well, my first thoughts, it seems, you know, if you're just getting into it, it seems like it's a daunting task. 
and it isn't. It is, you know, you can put together a pretty good home recording setup for a couple thousand bucks. Computer, a good microphone, some good loop libraries, and there's enough members of Broadjam that could help walk you through it. And we see it every day on our comments page on Broadjam. And you go to some of the key producers like uh, Sean Tallard and Protilius and Andy Mackin. All those guys are willing to help you walk through, uh, you know, what are the best pr production techniques. Um, the, I, I think, you know, the best thing if you're just setting up your home recording system is to get advice from as many people as you possibly can. You know, one person is going to tell you to use Logic, the other one's going to tell you to use Pro Tools, the other one's going to tell you, uh, you know, uh, use analog tape. I don't know if, if they tell you to use analog tape, then he's he's probably too old. You shouldn't be talking to that person. But the point is, is that you can really get into it and do a good job for a, a really cost, and th it, this is nothing new, I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, it's not that daunting, uh, it, it is not that difficult, you just got to open your mind, leave all the preconceived ideas at the door, and uh, you can get it done. Uh, personally, you know, I use a Dell laptop, uh, I still use Vegas, and I use Acid because of my previous company, Sonic Foundry. Um, and that and I just got a small little recording set up on my um, on my laptop, and allows me to have fun, make some music. Uh, I got some good microphones, and I don't need a whole lot more than that. Um, but I'm not pursuing it quite as heavily as uh, guys like Mike are uh, and and some of the other people on our site. So those are the people you want to talk to, and and I think you can get into this pretty easily and and. The, the, the learning curve can seem huge, but it's just not that big anymore. So don't be, don't be afraid to ask other people questions, and, um, and, and they'll give you the right guidance. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I, I was using Logic this morning, you know, in a, in a home recording setup, and, um, and I've had some things, you know, get represented and stuff like that that were recorded at home. Um, and... I, you know, I think Roy's got an awesome point. As if you hear somebody, a producer that's got something that sounds great, um, ask him about it. You know, put leave it in the comments section. You know, if you're listening on the Broadjam Top Tens or Broadjam Earth or something, you're like, man, that sounds awesome. I wonder where he recorded it. What kind of microphone did he or she use? Um, check on that because I think a, a lot of it sounds. Um, a lot of it starts with, excuse me, the sound of a good microphone. You know, of all the things you can skimp on. You know, you, you don't have to get the best analog to digital device in the world. You know, a $100 device can really, plug in your guitar into it, I mean, a $100 device can, can work just fine. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't have to get awesome recording software. You know, a lot of these things are just, you know, simple... A lot of these things can just be simple recording software. It can be Reaper, a free piece of software. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, or GarageBand that comes with any Macintosh or anything like that. That I mean, GarageBand's awesome. Stuff all the time. Stuff is recorded in GarageBand that you hear, like little snippets and tags and stuff like that on TV. Um, but the one thing that I wouldn't skimp on is a quality mic. You got to be able to hear. You got to be able to hear that voice. And that's the, that's the one thing I know that when we're listening to music, um, we're judging and we're rating it. A lot of times you're like, yeah, this sounds pretty good. And then the voice comes in, and that's the part that lacks. Um, concentrate on getting an awesome vocal performance. And if you can get that at home, that's, then the rest of it, you know, almost, it's always surrounding the vocal. I mean, Roy, I've seen your comments on a, on a ton of different songs now. And would you not agree that everything starts with the vocal? Everything what? Starts with the Everything starts with the vocal. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have a bad vocal, uh, I mean, it's just going to, whoever's listening is going to hit stop. Um, you know, it, it, Mike, Mike's point about the vocal is very important. Um, you know, you can have the greatest production in the world. You could take it into Abbey Road and have George Martin produce it. And for the young folks, that was the guy who produced the Beatles. That's that's humor, by the way, Mike. Oh, okay. It was okay. a band, real famous band in the 60s. That, but you, you could have the greatest producer ever and the greatest equipment ever, but if that vocal starts singing and that vocal is terrible, everything else is negated. 
okay, the drums can be slightly off, the guitars can be slightly off, and only trained ears will probably hear that. But if that vocal is bad, out of tune, everything else doesn't matter. So that's got to be the most important thing. And as Mike was talking about the microphone, you know, you can probably hear just in this broadcast right now the difference in the sound of the two rooms. Now, I can't hear the sound of my own room because I'm in it. I can't compare it, uh, but the people watching this can listen to Mike's voice and hear the slight reverb in the room he's in. And you may be able to hear the uh, air conditioning in the background in the room I'm in. That is, the room is very important as well. You can have a great microphone, but if you've got a big boomy room that's going to echo everything, everything you do, that's not good. So you might want to spend a little time just thinking about uh, where you're recording at home, uh, is there a lot of reverb? Uh, you want to deaden it as much as you can. Maybe hang a couple blankets on the wall. Uh, spouses sometimes don't like that. Um, from experience, I know that. Uh, uh, but you, you do what you got to do to make the sound right. So don't underestimate the sound of the room, the sound of the microphone, uh, to get that great vocal. And if people aren't going gaga over your vocal, get somebody else to sing it. We hear that so much. We hear good songs and bad vocals, and it'll kill a project every time. Uh, that, along the lines, you know, we got an email this week from a guy that said, um, my song is great, blah, blah, blah. I know the vocal's bad, but, you know, somebody out in Hollywood should be able to do a better job with that. Let's just be straight. 99% of every song that we place or any of our competitors place, it's broadcast ready. No one uh, takes a song and recuts it unless they have a big budget, unless it's a big budget film. But for television and low budget uh, uh, films, and that's basically everything we do, uh, you, it has to be broadcast ready. Uh, there's no exceptions to that. If you're pitching to Nashville or some other artist, again, make sure you have a good vocal. And if you're going to pitch to a certain artist, try to get somebody that sings like that artist uh, to sing the track for you. Now, I understand that's not easy either, but uh, always have a good vocal. That's the most important thing. Glad you brought that up, Mike. Yeah, I, 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 Roy, I think what you just said, um, when we're talking about pitching songs to artists or, or just pitching songs in general, um, when you said try to get somebody that sounds like the artist you're thinking of or pitching it to, or something. I mean that's an important thing in, in almost any of the uh, categories that we're talking about. Whether it's a soundtrack to a horror film or the background of a documentary or anything like that, getting the people you're pitching it to to share your vision, make it easy as possible for them to share your vision. You know, don't leave don't expect people's imaginations to just come in and fill in the blanks. If you think that this song is the perfect, uh, you know, is, is the perfect soundtrack to a documentary or the perfect soundtrack to a horror film, cut, you know, cut a piece of a horror film. You know, take a take yeah, a piece of point. Freddy versus Jason or I, 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 that's a ten year old horror film that shows how many horror films I've seen lately. Twenty years um, old. <laughs> right. So cut a little bit of cut a little bit of the Exorcist, you know, and then put your soundtrack on it. And you can do that on YouTube, you know. You can and put it on YouTube and, and, and put it there. Um, do those kind of things. And when you pitch it, say, check out, I made a substitute soundtrack for the Exorcist. Think how perfect it would be in your movie. Um, little things like that really do make the difference when you are helping people share your vision of where the song could be and, and the and the potential of the song. I know that sounds like a lot of work. Um, it is. But so is the music. I mean, if this was easy, don't you think every dude sitting in his basement with a guitar would be famous? It's not easy. It's not it, easy. No, it's not at all. No. You know, it's, funny, it's funny you bring that up, Mike, too, because one, one of the things we used to do years ago, and, and I still would recommend it, not only for film and TV, but try to write to a score. But if, you're gonna, if you want to get a song on the radio, Take your two favorite songs of all time, uh, put them on a disc, and put your song in between them, and listen to those three over and over and over again. And when you walk away, 
are you getting the same reaction from your tune? The fidelity, the sound quality, the mix, the production, the mastering, the songwriting, everything that you're getting from them, those other two songs. Now, that's hard for us as songwriters to say, you know, my song's as good as blah, 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 when you idolize that other person. But that sonic fidelity has to be to that level to get it on the radio. It has to be as good as your two favorite artists of all time. So put, it, put, put your stuff on a disc and put your songs in between it and listen to them over and over again, and you're going to start hearing flaws. And you're going to perfect those flaws over time. And it isn't something you can do the first time. And honestly, at this point in my life, as many times as I've been involved in productions, if I was going to go in and, and do a serious recording, other than playing around in my, in my home studio, if I was going to go make record, I would always hire an engineer. And the reason is, is I want somebody who's doing it every single day and is so in tune with their equi equipment and every possibility of that equipment, I would hire an engineer to do it. And number two is just so I can learn uh, what they're doing and watch them because the techniques change all the time. So the most important thing is compare your output to what's already out there because it doesn't matter how big the person is. You are competing with that person. So hopefully that helps a little. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. And, and think about what's appropriate for your genre. You know, if you write a song, if you're if you're writing a song like a Lady Gaga, let's say a Lady Gaga song or Rihanna or any of the real top forty pop stuff, that is some really complex production. Like as compared to, uh, you know, as compared to maybe uh, the way that folk and indie is right now. That I mean, some of the folk and indie stuff is something that is very easy to not easy to do, but it is very doable from your laptop. It's a little looser. It's a little looser, and the rules aren't quite as tight. Yeah, yeah, clearly. And so, trying to jump in, I mean, if you're going to try to do a top forty song, unless it's going to be an acoustic number or piano and voice, Alicia Keys and that kind of thing, um, or like Plain White Tees, just an acoustic guitar and, and a guy singing. Um, you you gotta you probably want to go to a studio for that unless you really have some incredible home recording chops. Hey, here's here's a little tip too, and and I think I do this still on every song. Somebody showed me this probably 25 or 30 years ago. We have a tendency with songs to, you know, we'll we'll, we'll start with a drum track, and we'll push the drum track up, then we'll push the bass up in the mix, then we'll push the guitars up, then we push the vocal, and we say, well. Now the vocal is a little too much, a little louder than the guitar. So we go back, and push the guitars up, then we push the keyboards up. Next thing you know, you have all of your faders, whether they're digital or not, maxed out. Try doing it the other way around. Push your master, uh, push your, uh, keep everything as low as you possibly can, and you can still hear it. So bring your drums into the mix. And, and keep everything as low as you possibly can. So you, what you do is you really you kind of bring the master faders all the way down to the bottom, push your drums up until you can hear them. But keep, remember, the masters are low, until you can just barely hear all the drum parts. Then push the bass up until you can just barely hear it. And do that with every instrument. Then when you're done, and go back and forth, go across all your tracks a few times. Then when you're done with that, push your master up. And what's interesting is if you've been doing it the other way, you're going to hear a completely different mix to your song. If you mix versus no vol or, uh, loud volume versus no volume. So that, that is really, a, you know, just give yourself different techniques to mix. Um, and it's just really important to, um, uh, to your ears to, to do that. You know, that's a, that's a good point. I, um, I did an interview with a drummer from Def Leppard a few, a few years ago. And he was, and I, really, I was interested in, in this. First of all, um, that he's still a great drummer with one arm. Yeah, so, I mean, it's an amazing story. Yeah, and, and second of all, like, what was their studio process like? Because I'm like, there's these years in the studio. I'm like, what did you guys do for years? And he really said, and he's just like, you know, one of the first things we do when we're mixing the song and listening to it. It's that you know how some people blast the music and the whole time they're just blasting it. And he's like, what we were doing is we would mix it at a conversational level. And we knew if it sounded awesome at a level that you could have a conversation over it, then it would sound even better once you crank the volume up. 
And uh, I think your point, Roy, about when you're listening to your own music, and I know I do this, is I'm sitting there and I've got the headphones on or i got the studio monitors and I'm like, yeah, I love, love it. And then you, t you make a CD yeah. of it or you put it on your MP3 player and you take it and you listen to it in your car and you're like, boy, it, it, it really sounded good there, but here it, it's not so much. Yeah. So volume, I think volume is, is essential. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um it's interesting. There's a comment here uh, about broadcast quality, and and I think that came from Andy Tagger. Is that correct, Mike? I'm not sure if it's the one above. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and he makes a good point. I think there's a perception that there was an intermediate step. This is what he says between. Um, I just changed that. between uh, pitching via broad jam and if successful, the receiver then taking the song and engineering it. Not in TV. It doesn't matter who you're pitching through. In fact, with most publishing companies today, you've got to give them broadcast quality. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, is that the tools are so plentiful now to make a good recording. If the receiver on the other end, and remember, the person on the other end is getting good recordings all day long every day. So if you're submitting recordings that aren't up to par, they, they're going to immediately have an opinion. Either the person doesn't understand, they're lazy, they don't want to do it, they don't have the funds to do it, or whatever the reason is, they're going to immediately draw a conclusion. So you should really try to get them uh, to broadcast quality. And it's not that hard, but I, I understand it could it can be uh, pretty challenging if you've never gone there. But that, I, I'm glad uh, Andy made that that uh, comment. Now, if you're pitching in Nashville or, or any, any label, they're going to recut it again anyhow, but you still want to have a decent demo with a good vocal. And that could just be an, an acoustic guitar, and a, but make sure the vocal is good. And a piano and a good vocal. Uh, and let them, you know, but, but also try to, you know, if you're pitching to somebody that, um, you know, it's a heavier country band, then try to make it a heavier country demo. But make sure that vocal is there. Good comment, Andy. And, and let's, I mean, I, we don't want to scare everybody by saying, like, yeah. Broad, you know, broadcast quality. You know that broadcast quality is this thing that's unattainable because it's absolutely, it's absolutely attainable. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. You know, let's say we. I mean, a lot of the people who are selected. I mean, just you can listen to all the songs that our providers select on Broad Jam, yeah. and you'll hear exactly what broadcast quality means. And sometimes broadcast quality is a really clean recording of someone with a piano and a nice vocal. You know, sometimes that's broadcast quality. And sometimes it's, there's an acoustic guitar. A lot of times broadcast quality can be electronic drums. If We know that most people in their home studios don't have the drum set and don't have the eight mics to set it up. But there's so many good samples and great drum machines out there that, uh, you know, you can make really real sounding drums for a reasonable, but we have BFD Echo on our site for a hundred bucks. Yeah, we had a sale on it last year for fifty bucks. So they, you know, they run these sales. You can BFD is on a thousand albums. You know, it's play too. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they, they got. Perfect. There's all kinds of people making all kinds of instruments. Uh, uh, you know, that are very accessible. Uh, another question, a comment that uh, uh, Adam Avery has here, and this is the. Uh, uh, the part I love about the site the most. If if somebody comes to our site today and and you ask them why they're joining Broad Jam, they're probably going to tell you it's because of the music licensing. The um, if somebody's been on the site for a year or two, they're going and you ask them why are you are still with Broad Jam, they're probably going to say exactly what Adam Avery said there is that the social network. I've got to meet so many other great musicians. The part about our site that I like the most, after almost 15 years of doing this, is just watching the interaction between the people. And recently I heard a song by two guys that I never met, Donovan Tucker and um, Mike Gladstone, an instrumental piece, uh, one of the best songs I've ever heard on Broad Jam as an instrumental. And seeing Adam uh, collaborate with other people, in fact I think Adam did a song with Donovan Tucker recently, and uh, Margaret and Liz Miller, and just all these different people that collaborate. But that's what, what's happening here, is it's making everybody better. By working with other songwriters, it makes you better, it stretches you, it takes you out of your the, the, the ruts we get into as songwriters. It helps you break that songwriting block. 
it's so important. And I think there's a, a real uh, marketing reason, and I don't think that's what, why people do this, but you know, if you write a song with 50 other people, you now have 50 people pushing, 51 people pushing your music. It's really that simple. But that isn't why people write with other people. Uh, they get. You can see, uh, you know, over the years, I've just seen so many writers just get better and better and better, and the producers get better just because they're working with other people that are might be slightly better or not quite as good as them. But everybody has a different idea and perspective, and that's the part of, of, of Broadjam that I am the most proud of that we've provided that uh, connection. But what's even better is that our musicians are taking advantage of it. Good question or good comment, Adam. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and you know, you talk about the six pack in that particular question or that particular comment. And the six pack is where a lot of these people meet. Yeah. You know, which we just we just launched a six pack again for 2014. And for those of you that don't know what the six pack is, it's a songwriting competition consisting of six different songwriting challenges. And uh, you can submit as many songs as you want to each challenge, and it's kind of a cumulative thing. So instead of just saying like the best song competition, it's really about the best. You know, it's really about the songwriter and the, the variety of songs that they create, the quality of that variety, and uh, versatility and diversity of music um, really counts in the six pack. And the reason it's fun is we have a leaderboard that constantly changes based on people's votes. I mean, it's one of the most unique songwriting competitions in the industry not just because um, not just because it's you know it's multiple songs instead of just one but also because the leaderboard is exciting so it'll change constantly and it's a horse race and it's fun to be part of the horse race right into the end when at the end that somebody's gonna win I mean and I you know I was part of the shipping of these prizes I was doing a lot of awesome prizes and they get they get to know the other people in the competition. There's no other songwriting competition where people know each other and talk to each other the whole time. And uh, the leaderboard's going, and you know it's it's like, hey man, I was number one last week. No, you're number one. You know, I'm gonna come to your house. No, nobody says that. But you know what I mean? It's it, it's fun, and uh, the six pack is exciting. Roy, what was what was the idea? I don't even know this. What was the idea behind the six pack? When, what was the inspiration? So ten years. I, I, I remember. The, I, I remember the moment. It was uh, we had a guy that worked here, Donnie, uh, and I were talking about it. And there might have been a couple other people in the conversation as well. And we wanted to create. You know, there's so many song contests out there that the song is judged. We wanted a contest where the songwriter is judged, not the song, because we all have one or two great songs. We wanted to find those people who have six or ten or twenty great songs, uh, the prolific writers. Uh, just about everybody on our site has at least one or two. Sorry, my phone just rang. But everybody on our site uh, has one or two really good songs. Uh, we want that. We wanted to. Find, we wanted to create a contest um, that songwriters. Are, are, are discovered and the other thing the other key uh, component of this is that we didn't want to be involved in picking the winner we wanted the members who submitted the songwriters who are submitting and participating to to judge each other in a blind listening format now that certainly proved to be um, challenging at times to it's manage right. that it's challenging it's all right. but the point is is that you know you're picking when you win this it's a six month uh, marathon uh, you're checking the leaderboard a few times a day. And when you win or you even place in the top 10, you got hundreds and hundreds of your peers that have said you're one of the best songwriters on Broad Jam. And if you don't win a, a prize, if you don't win it, not one dollar of prizes, that in uh, itself, because there is no songwriting contest that is that 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 I know of that finds the best songwriter. They find the best songs. And, and I'm really happy for this, the people that, that participate. Okay, so I, Roy, we missed you for the last 30 seconds. You you, oh. you stop. So why don't you, why don't you just restate your last your last? I, I just said that uh, you know we're really I, I'm really happy that this has turned into the contest that picks the best songwriter and not the best song. Oh, there are good songs. Don't get me wrong. You have to have five or six good ones to even be considered in this. But the point is, is that your peers are picking you. 
that, you know, certainly you could have some industry judge that comes and listens to three songs that, that Broad Jam presents to them and they pick the winner. That isn't how this is done. Every song has the same number of votes. What we do is when you add a song in, no, let's say you don't get in until November, we make sure that song has the same number of votes or, or ratings applied to it as the song that's entered in July. So we make sure every song is, is voted on equally and it's all peer reviewed. Now, the people at Broad Jam do. We log in and we listen and we cast our own votes as well. We participate as well. So we certainly have our favorites, but our votes can't sway uh, sway the outcome at all because there's yeah. so many members that are participating. Our votes are the same as anybody else's. Like if you ask your mom to come in and you know listen to some songs, our votes count just the same. Just the same. And you know when I first came to Broad Jam and we participated in the six pack and stuff like that, you know I was surprised how honest everything was. Like checking for cheating, making sure that anything we do doesn't sway the, you know, I just figure it's the entertainment industry. Everything you've heard about the entertainment industry is true. You know, like everything you've heard that it's a manipulative and all these things, that's absolutely true. So I was just, I couldn't believe it that at Broad Jam, like, no, no, we check for these guys with multiple, you know, the, the same IP address and multiple users and we make sure that nothing we do affects it and that everything is 100% on the up and up. And I found that really refreshing uh, and different than any of my other experiences in entertainment. Oh, there's, yeah, I, there are people who have issues with us, but I can tell you one thing is that we, that, that, that uh, there's no, no funky stuff going on here. Yeah. At least not as long as I'm in charge. But anyway, that, uh, uh, Diana Rasmussen logged in and, um, um, and, she uh, makes, says a um, great point, uh, Roy and Adam, about uh, collaboration. How do you decide who to collaborate with? You know, and that's, <laughs> that's a good question. I wish there was a definitive answer to that. But I think the answer is, is finding uh, someone who is writing similar music first. So you can perfect your collaboration skills. Um, I've always encouraged people to step outside their genres. Uh, because that makes you stretch and it makes you better when you come back to your genre. But but find somebody who's writing similar music. Uh, you know, Diana has a, a good kind of jazz pop feel to her music, and maybe a hint of country, country or folk. That's probably where I would go if I was you, Diana. Find somebody like that on the site that's similar. Um, the other thing I would encourage everybody to do, there is nothing uh, more refreshing than when you write a song and you find somebody else to sing it. And somebody, the first time, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I ever heard somebody else sing one of my songs. Uh, and I, at that point, I said, I'm never singing any of my songs ever again. <laughs> I'm going to always have somebody else do it because they interpret it differently and they add such flavor to it. So maybe that's how you start writing if you're uncomfortable actually sitting in a session with somebody or doing it online. Send, a, you know, send them a track with your raw vocal and then say, can you take a shot at singing this? That might be a way to start the collaboration. It would be the easiest way to start the collaboration. Yeah, that's, I mean, I mean or just... Find a song you like. You know, if you're going through and you find something you like, like, damn, I want to write a song with this person because yeah. they've done something great. Or you see somebody get selected on something, yeah. hmm, that person, you know, is an active songwriter, somebody participating in the site, somebody there. That's the kind of person you're like, and and they're creating music of the quality that's that's quality enough to get, you know, to be on a pro level. Yeah, yeah. If See if they want to collaborate. You know that's that's great. Plus, you're working with somebody now who you know is at a pro level, and also who's if it, if it's a great song, they're going to push it too. And uh, that and we show that right in the you know the listings and stuff like that. And every even the old listings and stuff like that, you can log in and you can see who's been selected and and uh, that kind of thing. That's a great way to find out who's doing well. You know, find the find out who's doing well. Contact them. See if you can collaborate with the internet. It's it's easy. Yeah, and you know, and one thing that you might want. Let me just shut this call off here. Uh, one thing that you might want to do is see if somebody is collaborating with a lot of other people, because that means they're probably pretty easy to collaborate with, 
if they're writing songs with a whole bunch of different people. Um, you know, and I just think it's so important. In fact, I, I was just doing this uh, um, blog that I've been working on, and I looked at the top 100 songs of the current 100 songs. I think it was July 19th, the Billboard charts, July 19th. 94 of them had writers listed, and I just didn't spend the time to look up the other six songs. Of those 94 songs, there were 359 writers almost four writers per song. One song had 16 writers on it. And now what they may have done is they, they may have had samples from the 70s or 80s and they just credited those writers and I don't know that. But the average song uh, had four writers per song. No genre had less than three writers per song. And I, I think the, the reason is I think the labels I think the labels understand that the songs get better when more people write them. And by the way, of those 94 songs, only eight of those songs had solo writers. And all of those solo writers were the artists that sang the song. Pharrell Williams, John Levins, uh, or uh, Legend, John Legend, I'm sorry, uh, Contos from a, a, a newer band, uh, Ryan Tedder. Uh, these guys, uh, they're the performers of the songs. So it's, it's really hard to write a song as a solo writer and get it performed by another artist. In fact, according to the stats, it's, it's a, you have a 0% chance of doing that with current charts. Uh, somebody keeps calling me here. Sorry about that. So uh, the other uh, question Diana had here, too, she said, where did you get the picture for can six in the six-pack? For those of you who don't know, we call each contest a can in the six-pack. And that actually came from... Uh, Yamaha, and that picture is the prize package. That is the, un the new uh, Yamaha white motif with the speakers, and that is the prize package. And that that rig is near is worth five thousand bucks or close to it, I believe. So it's a, it's an excellent keyboard. The motif has been one of the best keyboards going for years, and uh, I'm really excited about that uh, that particular prize. Um, we may have to get Yamaha to send one here for us to test out. Uh, Absolutely. Right yeah. So, Man, I didn't know that. That's, that's cool. I'm really excited about that prize. So, uh, Sorry, boy, my phone's ringing off the hook. And, Roy, I know you have, you have a meeting to get to in just a couple of minutes. Let's finish one last question uh, that Andy asked. And this is a good question. And because a lot of our members are international, are there any difficulties or problems when you submit from the UK or international? Yeah, the, 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 there really isn't, I mean, if you're talking about licensing, which I, uh, there, there are no issues. I mean, you can submit from anywhere on the planet. Just make sure you have, you know, Performance Rights Society. Uh, and there's a bunch of them in the, in the UK. Just make sure they have affiliations with BMI or ASCAP. Uh, so there's no real issue. Now, with the six-pack, we do run into some shipping issues. Uh, but we usually get all the products uh, out within six or eight months after the contest closes because we have to get them from the manufacturers. They send them to us at the end of their fiscal sometimes, and uh, sometimes we don't get the prizes. In fact, some of them we just got last week for last year. So if, if your question is referring to the contest, uh, then sometimes we it takes a little longer to get the prizes uh, outside of the U.S. But uh, if you're talking about listings for film and TV, there's no issue there. Uh, just make sure you're affiliated with a performance rights society in your country. That's right. And, and we, we, have, um, we have listings from the UK on our site where, I mean, that would be, that would be if you're already with PRS, the Performing Rights Society of, of the UK, then you, you should be fine. But just make sure that all of your legal ducks are in order with the songs in your home country. And if they are in your home country, because... ASCAP and BMI have agreements with every single thing, and, and like our like our Tinderbox opportunities, those those are soundtracks for the Discovery Channel, and the the, the family of the you know the family of Discovery Station, and so those royalties can come in from 160 different countries wherever Discovery has a broadcast, and so you want to make sure that all of your ducks are in a row in your own country and you got everything set up because what will happen is is that you know Namibia or something like that will report the show of your you know the, 
the play of your song during one of these Discovery Channel documentaries, and you're going to want to make sure that in the UK that your PRS has an agreement with the you know, Million Performing Rights Society in order to get that. So no problem at all. We have international artists all the time get selected and get deals for their tracks. Um, Australia and UK are you know really big because obviously there are other English-speaking countries. Canada, of course. So all the English-speaking countries, because that's a lot of what we deal with. But also we're getting, I mean, we get people from Italy uh, and France a lot too, Switzerland, and uh, some of those countries where they're having some luck, in, you know, and their English songs or their instrumentals uh, get picked up by some of the uh, providers. So thank you for that question, Andy. And I think that's going to be our last one. Um, for this particular hangout. So thank you for everybody that asked questions and was watching live and participated. Anyone watching this on YouTube later, yep. you can feel free to uh, send us any question you'd like. I'll put our uh, details in the, uh, the video notes, but mike at broadjam.com is my email address, and feel free to ask me any questions you'd like. And um, I'm Roy. Roy. Roy at broadjam.com. You can always always send an email to me. And by the way, I have a blog called Online Notes that I review songs to. Uh, and if you want to go there, I do a pretty in-depth review of various songs. So, uh, you know, hopefully you can uh, gain a little knowledge there and share a little as well. You're welcome to join in a review with me. So, yes, yeah. feel free to send us a question anytime. So you can join in on the conversation if you're sending to Online Notes. Uh, and you'd like you know, a review or something like that, I would recommend sending your Broadjam link. Um, we have plenty of Broadjam artists who are looking for a review. So if you send a YouTube link or you send a SoundCloud or something like that, we're going to review the Broadjam artists first and exclusively because that's our website. That's so I'll plug this on the Broadjam, yeah. send us a link, and then we love to review it. But um, okay. Until then, right. he says, Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us in the Hangout, Andy. Thank you for the questions, Andy Adam. and Adam and Diana. Uh, so from Minneapolis, this is Mike. You guys have an awesome week. We'll see you online. And from Madison. I'm Roy. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you for being members. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Everybody have a great week, and um, we'll see you online.